Hello everyone. It's good to be with you again as we study the first portion of the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter. That first part of the Sermon on the Mount, which is commonly referred to as the Beatitudes. Of course, the Beatitudes is Latin for the word happy or happiness. And we uh, see that because the word blessed, which begins each Beatitude, uh, each step that Jesus puts forth, uh, that he wants the children of God to be like, uh, that word, of course, blessed means happy uh, or content or that we're fortunate uh, to be uh, under the care of God, to have his blessings. And that, of course, brings us the happiness, uh, joy and contentment and peace uh, that is promised the child of God. We've looked at the uh, first two, that being blessed is the poor in spirit which, of course, is the recognition uh, that we are helpless and impoverished in our spiritual state, and that we can do nothing about it, but that we need God to bring us up uh, from that. We also discussed uh, the blessed or happy are those who mourn. That is mourning over the sin that is in our lives, mourning the fact that we have hurt our God, mourning the fact that we are in a condition uh, caused by sin that we can do nothing about. And that causes us to mourn, mourn that we have done uh, such things, mourn that we have put ourselves in that condition. And of course, turning ourselves over to God uh, for the comfort uh, that he wants. This brings us to our third beatitude that we're going to be discussing uh, during this class session. And that is in Matthew, the fifth chapter in verse five, where Jesus speaks on the Sermon of the Mount and he says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those basically who respond to God's will, who respond to God's will with a heart that says, thy will be done instead of my will be done. And we're going to see how that uh, plays into it. Of course, meekness is, is a word that's greatly misunderstood. And we know this. Uh, when we've talked about meekness before in various classes, uh, we've heard it preached in various sermons. Uh, we know that meekness is a great, uh, is, is, a, is a misunderstood word uh, that the world distorts that the world has a different view of meekness than what God has. And so let's look, take a moment and look at the meaning of this word. Of course, in the Greek, the word is simply defined as a gentle or mild, or as it's translated, meek. In some places it's translated gentle. Other places, this very same word is translated meek uh, in the New King James uh, Version, uh, which I, we are using uh, during this class session. Of course, we know the worldview of meekness, the worldview of someone who's gentle, of someone who's mild uh, in nature, is that this is just simply weakness. And Jesus says that the meek are going to inherit the earth. And the world can't view that. The world can't view that, that, that someone who is gentle and mild in spirit, someone who is under control of their uh, actions, of their strength, so to speak, is someone that can inherit the earth. The worldview is that if you want something in this earth, you go out and get it. You don't let anyone stop you. And in that way, you will get what you want. You will get from this world the things that you desire. And you just need to go out and take it and be strong and, and, and do whatever it takes to go out and achieve the goals that you want to achieve. And of course it works. We see people all the time that, that have an attitude, basically the opposite of meekness, the opposite of gentleness. And we look at that and we go, well, they get everything they want because it works in the world. 
But God does not want his people to be a people of, of, of harshness, a proud people in their own estimation. Uh, they don't want people, uh, God does not want people who rely on themselves to go out and take things. God wants people who are meek and says that the way to happiness, the way to this contentment and peace that the world blessed means, he says, blessed are the meek. Happy are the meek. That's what God has promised. That's what God has told us. That's what Jesus was telling us on the Sermon on the Mount, that the meek are blessed. And so what's God's view of what meek means? Meekness is someone who is teachable. Meekness is, is, is a, someone who has a gentle and mild spirit, but someone who is teachable. In Psalm, the 25th chapter, and in verse 9, David writes, The humble, or the meek, the humble he guides in justice. Notice, he guides, that is, God guides in justice, and the humble, or the meek, he, or God, teaches his way. And so those who are humble, those who are meek, those who are gentle and mild in spirit, are those who listen to God, who are able to be taught by God, not relying on their own wisdom, not relying on their own think-sos, but who are teachable, who listen to what God has to say and adopt it and allow God to guide us in what is just, allow God to guide us in what we need to know and the way we need to live. And so one who is meek is one who relies on someone else, that being God, to teach us the way that we need to go. And so that is part of being meek. God's view is also a one who uh, has a low esteem in their spirit, or is, who is called lowly in spirit. Jesus describes himself that way uh, when he he talks in uh, Matthew, the 11th chapter, in verse 29, where he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. Learn what? For I am gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus calls himself gentle and lowly in heart. And we'll look more at, at, at the example Jesus gives in this uh, later on in this, in this lesson. But Jesus calls himself lowly, uh, gentle and lowly in heart. Gentle and lowly in heart. And he says, and you will find rest for your souls. Learn from me, for I am gentle uh, and lowly in heart. And so that's what meekness means. To be gentle and lowly in heart. Not have a, a self-inflated uh, a, a version of self, a self-inflated opinion as to who you are and how important your opinion is and how much you know above others. But being gentle and lowly in heart, putting, putting others more important as yourself, which we see Jesus doing. Basically, everything that Jesus was, everything that Jesus is, is what we need to adopt. And part of that is being lowly in heart. And, and so we look at that as part of the definition of this meekness. Being teachable, being lowly in heart, being gentle. In 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, in verse 1, Paul writes, Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness of, and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. And so Paul calls himself lowly. He says, when I'm with you, I'm lowly. I'm teaching you boldly now, but when I'm with you, I am lowly. And he pleads with them by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And so this part of being gentle with people Basically, the opposite 
of harshness. Paul says, when I'm with you, I'm lowly. I am gentle. Not harsh. Not going out and, and, and proving your point by, by being louder than someone else or by being more intimidating than someone else, but being gentle and lowly in heart. And, and, and that is, is what God wants. God also wants uh, meekness, and God's view of meekness is also one who is patient. In Psalm the 37th chapter and in verse 9, notice what he says, what, what David writes. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, those who have that patient, they shall inherit the earth. And of course, what does Jesus say? The meek shall inherit the earth. And God says, those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. In verse 11 of that same chapter, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And so this happiness, this peace comes to the meek. The meek will inherit the earth. Those that wait on the Lord. Those who are patient. Those who don't, don't want these results right now, but are patient and trusting in the Lord that this happiness and the ultimate goal uh, that, of God's promises will come to us. That's part of being meek. Being teachable, being gentle, being patient. Meekness is, is not just strength. Uh, or, 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 or meekness isn't the opposite of strength, I should say. Uh, meekness is not is not someone we look at as weak, but meekness is is one who is strong, but who has that strength under control. Think about a, a wild animal. A wild animal is tamed. In fact, think about a tiger or a lion. And the power that that wild animal has to utterly destroy anything that comes into its path. We see these, these animals take down other animals much larger than them because they have the power to do that. They have the strength to do that. But when those same animals are tamed under the control of someone else, their power isn't diminished. But in the presence of the one who has tamed them, in the presence of the one who has controlled them, or in the one that they trust, that being a human, and we've seen it in circuses, uh, we've seen it in, in various uh, uh, films, uh, you can of course see it on YouTube or, or any of these other things, but these animals are, it display a gentleness because they trust or are under the control, allow themselves to be under the control of someone or something else. Their strength isn't diminished. They just have their strength under control. And that's what it means to be meek. Not, not less strength. But that strength under control, that, that strength that is guided by someone or something else, just like that tamed wild animal. Being meek is not being spineless. It's not being passive. But it is one who places their strength under the control of someone else specifically under the control of God. We as a meek people, we as, as children of God, displaying our meekness, are no less strong than anyone else, are not, are not weak or cowardly or spineless, but we allow our strength to be under the control of God. We channel our strength in the way that God wants us to channel it, that is being meek because we give up control of our strength 
to someone else, specifically to our Father in Heaven and to our Lord. That is being one who is meek, who, who, who we just don't go and, and use our strength the way we think it needs to be used. We look outside of ourselves with a humble and gentle heart, putting others and the benefit of others and the trust of God above what our think so's are, above what we would want. And that is a meek person. Strength under control, specifically under the control of God. Not weakness, not spinelessness, not a cowardly heart, but strength under the control of God. That is the meekness that God wants in his children. We can look some, at some examples in Scripture of those who are meek and, and those who are the way that God wants them to be. And, and we can look at three examples, specifically kind of a, a, a before and after picture, if you will. Now let's take Moses, for instance. Moses uh, was a man who God, uh, who is recorded, was very humble. But he didn't start out that way. In Numbers, the 12th chapter, verses uh, 2 and 3, uh, this is where Aaron and Miriam had, had, had challenged Moses' authority. This same Moses, who before, when someone uh, was offending who he, who he knew were his people, that being the Egyptian, he killed him. He used his strength the way he thought it should be done, and he killed that Egyptian. And of course, all kinds of bad things happened because of that, and he left the land, but then God came to him. And God spoke to Moses. And I remember Moses resisted at first, but then humbled himself to God and started doing things the way God wanted him to do. Moses was not a weak man. Moses was, was, was one who God gave the authority to lead his people out of Egypt, to lead his people up to the entrance of the promised land. Moses was not weak. Moses was not spineless. Moses went and stood before Pharaoh and spoke the things that God wanted him to speak. But yeah, Moses is called humble. Moses is called meek. Again, in Numbers, the 12th chapter, verses 2 and 3. Again, Aaron and Miriam had challenged his authority, saying, well, doesn't God speak to us also? Beginning in verse 2, he said, So they, that being Aaron and Miriam, said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. The Lord heard them. Verse 3, in parentheses, it says, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. This was who Moses was at that time. Moses whom God came to through the burning bush and spoke to him. Moses, who stood before Pharaoh and, and, and changed his staff into a snake and then pulled it up again. Moses, through whom God put the plagues upon Egypt. Moses, through whom God spoke directly. Moses, who went up on the mountain and, and in the presence of God received his law. Moses, who had conversations with God that are recorded in the Old Testament. But yet Moses was very humble. And it's even demonstrated in this case, because when the Lord heard this, he struck Miriam with leprosy. But Moses reacted, not in a way that says, well, look, 
Miriam, you got what you deserve. You challenged me, and that's what you get. That's what God has given to you. But no. Moses pleaded with the Lord to take her leprosy away, which the Lord did after seven days. That's a humble man. Not, not the same man that killed that Egyptian, but a man who took his strength and all the strength that he had and put it under the control of God and wanted to do what God wanted him to do. That is a meek man. Peter. We know Peter was a very uh, impetuous, uh, a very volatile uh, person. He was a zealot. That was kind of their way. And we see that the, you know, the picture of Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane, when someone came and challenged Jesus, that, that he wasn't going to take that. And he pulled his sword and cut off the ear of the servant. But in Acts, after Jesus had ascended, we see a different Peter. A Peter who is teaching Jesus among the people and was taken up in Acts 5 and put into prison and was beaten and was jailed. But Peter didn't call for the army of the Lord to come against these people. Uh, Peter, Peter didn't... didn't didn't threaten violence or do violence like he did in the Garden of Eden. But when these, uh, the council told him he could no longer teach Jesus, Peter said, I will do, uh, we ought to do, we ought to obey God rather than men, as recorded in Acts the fifth chapter. That is one who puts his strength under the control of God. Each of us still has our power. When we obey God and become the meek people that God wants us to be, we don't, our, our power isn't diminished. Our strength isn't diminished. We don't suddenly become spineless and cowardly people, but we become people who are under God's control. That is meekness. Jesus said, again in Matthew the 11th chapter, I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart. I am meek and lowly in heart. That's Jesus. Jesus is the perfect picture of meekness. Jesus says, I want you to be meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And Jesus says, look at me. I will show you meekness. In John, the, tw the second chapter, verses 13 through 16, we have recorded uh, Jesus driving out the money changers. He takes and makes a scourge and whips, and he, and he drives them out with those things. And Jesus says in John, uh, the, the uh, second chapter, verse 16, he says, and he said to those who sold doves, after he had driven them out, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Now picture Jesus saying that. And do you picture Jesus saying it in this way? Well, now, take these things and uh, away. Just, just, just take these things away and, and, and don't make my father's house a house of merchandise after he scourged them? No. Jesus, these are words of firmness. Words that said, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Jesus acted in a way that God wanted him to act. Jesus displayed boldness. Jesus displayed a uh, 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 something that he needed to do to drive sin out. Jesus reacted to the sin of the day. And sometimes it takes a stronger reaction to, to do those things. No one would say 
that Jesus was weak. No one would say that Jesus was spineless. No one would say that Jesus was cowardly. But we look at this example, and we look at Jesus' reaction to it. Now, what Jesus could have done and had the power to do was to wipe everyone out that was there and to strike them dead. But he drove them out and taught God's lesson there. He had his strength, not what he could have done, but what he did. Strength under control, under the control of the will of God. Jesus allowed men to abuse him. Jesus allowed men to spit on him. Jesus allowed those men who nailed him on the cross to disrespect him and actually allowed them. He allowed them to nail him to the cross. We find that he could have called legions of angels down. as he told Peter. He could have called legions of angels down to defend him, but he allowed people to nail him to the cross. Why? Because he was afraid? Why? Because he didn't have the power to do it? Because he was meek? No, because his power was under the control of the Father. And he said, thy will be done to the Father. That is meekness. Strength under control. And of course, we're told that the meek, those who have their strength under God's control, uh, those who have that gentle and quiet heart and allow God to control them, who allow themselves to be humbled before God, who allow God to work through them and not us just working through ourselves. Those people, Jesus said, will inherit the earth. They will get that reward. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 31 through 33, Jesus said, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? The things of this world. Or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. That's the worldly things. He says, Don't worry about that, because he says, For your Father in heaven knows that you need these things. But, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, all these worldly things, shall be added to you. Jesus says, trust God. Trust his kingdom. Put his kingdom first. Put the kingdom of heaven first. The kingdom of God first. And you won't have to worry about worldly things. In Ecclesiastes, we we read about all the the vain things uh, that come, the the vanity of of chasing after the things of this world. But in Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, we're told at the very end that, that God gives us these things to enjoy. And we enjoy them not because we got them, but because we realize that they are gifts from God. In Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, verse 19, he says, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, whom God has given riches and wealth, and has given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. And notice what he says, for those who realize that these things are the gift of God and not something that we get ourselves, He says, for he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. And so when you recognize that the worldly things that we that we possess, not the amount of worldly things that we have, but what God has given to us. And we are thankful for what God has allowed us to have. Then we can enjoy them. Because we're not looking at, well, I I could get more, or I need more. But we can enjoy the things of the earth. And so we can inherit the earth. The meek who allow themselves to be under the control of God can enjoy the things of this earth. But more importantly, we're also promised a new heavens 
and a new earth that the children of God will inherit. Uh, the new heavens and the new earth uh, mentioned in Second Peter, the third chapter and verse 13. That when Jesus comes, this earth shall be wiped out, but there will be a new heavens and a new earth. That, that place where, where the, the children of God will dwell, who will be in the presence of God in this new heavens and the new earth, that is what the children of God will inherit. And that is the promise of God, that his people will inherit eternal life, eternal life in the presence of the Father, eternal life in heaven. That is what we will inherit, the new heavens and the new earth promised by God. The meek will inherit that. The meek who give themselves over to God, who give their control over to God, who take themselves out of themselves and put their trust in God and their concern in others and their concerns outside of themselves, who allow their strength, the people who allow their strength, us who allow ourselves to have our strength and our power controlled and guided by God. That is the meek, and the meek shall truly inherit the earth, and the meek shall be happy, and the meek shall be content, and the meek shall have peace. That's what God has promised. Do we trust him? Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you have had a good week, and I hope that you have a good week to come. As always, may God bless you.